In this week's video, we want to discuss different options for securing a wireless network. Hi, my name is Kevin, and in this video, which is an excerpt from our Network Plus video training series, we're going to begin by understanding the goals for wireless security. What exactly are we trying to do with all the tools we're going to be discussing in this video? Then we'll take a look at a couple of options for key distribution. Keys can be used in encryption algorithms, and we've got the option of using a pre-shared key. And while that's good for a smaller network, it's not going to scale very well, so we'll see what the option is for an enterprise network. Then we'll discuss a variety of wireless security standards such as WPA, WPA2, and WPA3, as well as some of the standards that came prior to WPA. And then we're going to wrap it up with a few additional ways that we can better protect a wireless network. We can do things such as having guest access. We can have MAC address filtering. We can require a user go through a captive portal. We can even do geofencing. And this training is an excerpt from our Network Plus video training series, which is available at our Udemy site. If you'd like to check out that course, as well as our other certification training courses, just go to kwtrain.com slash Udemy. Again, that's kwtrain.com slash Udemy. Now let's dive into wireless network security. In this video, we want to consider some wireless security options. And the big goal that we have is we want to protect the information flowing through radio waves from any potential eavesdroppers or have anybody get access to the network that should not have access to the network. Let's say, for example, that we have an access point in our building. Would you ever consider putting an Ethernet port in your parking lot where somebody could just drive up to your building and plug into your building's network? Probably not. But that's essentially what we're doing if we have an unsecured access point because the radio waves from that access point could radiate outside of the building and somebody might be sitting in the parking lot and attempting to get on the corporate network. A couple of quick ways we could address a situation like that is we could position the antenna in the access point somewhere else so it does not radiate outside of the building. Or we could reduce the signal strength so its coverage area is less. But if somebody does get access to our wireless signal, we want to make sure that before they can get on the network that they authenticate themselves. They need to provide some user credentials to prove they belong on the network. And as we're sending traffic across the wireless network, we want it to be encrypted. So if anybody were to intercept it, it would be all scrambled up and they would not be able to read the data if they did intercept it. Now let's talk about some different options for doing authentication, encryption, and filtering wireless clients. To begin with, let's go way back in time to the original 802.11 standard. The uh, security mechanism built into that was called WEP, W-E-P, Wired Equivalent Privacy. The implication meaning that this is as private as being on a wired connection. That is not true at all. This is a very weak encryption. It is trivial to break. And the backstory is it uses the RC4 encryption algorithm, which is RON's code 4. And RC4 in itself is not bad. It's the way it's implemented in WEP. You see, what happens is with WEP, we have a pre-shared key. My wireless router or my wireless access point, it's pre-configured with this key. And if I want to get my iPhone or my laptop on the network, I put in that same key on my mobile device. And if the keys match, we're going to be able to communicate somewhat securely on the network. And what WEP does, it takes the original data, it takes that shared secret key, and it takes a 24-bit initialization vector, or an IV, and it mathematically combines those, and that's what gets transmitted. The weakness in WEP is largely because of the length of that initialization vector. It's only 24 bits. The good news is that's been improved upon over the years, and we'll check that out later in this video. But first, let's think about that concept of a key. The way I described it, I said we had a pre-shared key. This is also known as personal mode. This is where we have a key that is typed into the access point and typed into our wireless device. And if the keys match, these devices can communicate securely between one another. However, in an enterprise environment, this is not going to scale very well. If we had a thousand employees, we don't want to hand out the same pre-shared key to all 1,000 employees, that key could become compromised. Somebody might give it out. Somebody might leave the company, and do we have to then go back and change the key on every device? No, it's simply not scalable. So in an enterprise, we want to use enterprise mode. And with enterprise mode, we have a authentication server, and the client is going to attempt to authenticate from that authentication server. 
It's going to say, hey, I'd really like to join the network. Here is my username. Here is my password as an example. And maybe we've got this radius server acting as the authentication server. And it's going to generate a key that's only good for this session. And it's only good between this client and this access point. So the session key is going to be unique to this session. Now let's define some terms here. We have a supplicant, an authenticator, and an authentication server. This goes back to the IEEE 802.1x standard. And in that standard, a supplicant is a device that wants to get access to the network. That's what it means to supplicate, to ask something. Now, the authenticator, I think, is almost misleading in its name because the authenticator is not doing authentication. The authenticator is simply passing the credentials on to the authentication server. And since this can work in both a wired network or a wireless network, sometimes the authenticator is a layer 2 switch that's configured for 802.1x. Or sometimes, as we see here, the authenticator is an access point for wireless clients. And there are several different methods that can be used to hand out those keys and to authenticate the client. Those different methods are called EAPs, Extensible Authentication Protocols. And we're going to take a look at a few EAP examples in an upcoming video. For now, just realize that there are various ways that that RADIUS server our authentication server, can authenticate the supplicant and give it keys for the duration of the session. So to review, we said that WEP, we were not a fan because it was very weak. Well, after WEP came TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. This is vastly superior to WEP. And you might be surprised to learn that it also uses RC4, but it does it much better. It uses a 48-bit initialization vector, and that doesn't make it just twice as good as WEP's 24-bit initialization vector. No, it's orders of magnitude more secure. But better than RC4 is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. This is vastly superior to most of the other encryption standards out there today. And that's what we use typically on today's wireless networks. And when you're setting up a wireless router or a wireless access point, you're probably not going to be choosing WEP if that's even an option for you. After WEP, there was the option for WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access. Now, this used TKIP to do the encryption. So it was much better than the WEP version of RC4. It had that stronger initialization vector. And one of the cool things about the way WPA used TKIP is that if we had older hardware that didn't really have the uh, processing power to handle the advanced encryption standard, it could get enhanced encryption with TKIP using existing hardware. So it was sort of an interim step as we were moving from weak encryption with WEP and lower powered hardware. Because that older hardware, it could still run the RC4 algorithm. It was just doing it with more bits. But after WPA came WPA2, Wi-Fi Protected Access 2. And as of 2006, in order to be certified by the Wi-Fi Alliance, a device had to support WPA2. And if a device supported WPA2, there is a requirement that it support AES. And we've already said that AES is going to require more processing power than TKIP. So WPA2 can be more processor intensive than WPA. Do we have to upgrade everybody, though, right away? Not necessarily. Just because WPA2 is required to support AES, that doesn't mean we always have to support it. You can configure many WPA2 access points out there to turn off AES and run TKIP. Or you can enable both. So your older clients can use TKIP and your newer clients can use AES. But the best practice today is for everybody to use AES. And for a decade, this was the go-to wireless security protocol. It was very resistant against attacks until 2016. Then there was a vulnerability discovered. It was called the crack vulnerability. So what replaced WPA2? You guessed it. It was WPA3. And it still uses AES. And it uses specifically 128-bit AES for personal mode, in other words, pre-shared key mode. But if you're using it in the enterprise mode, you can have an enhanced version of AES, 192-bit AES. And a security vulnerability that has been around for years with wireless devices is when an attacker might send management frames into the wireless device to try to disassociate a client 
from an access point, essentially knocking a client off of the access point. And then when they try to reattach, the attacker may have a duplicate access point set up of their access point, And they're wanting that victim as they try to reattach to connect to their access point. But with WPA3, we now have protected management frames that prevents that type of thing from happening. There's also a protection mechanism against brute force password attacks, and it's called Simultaneous Authentication of Equals, or SAE. Now, again, the name I don't think really describes what it's doing because the specific protection it's giving us is preventing somebody from doing a brute force attack offline. They actually have to be communicating on the network to try a password to see if it works. So if somebody wanted to bombard an access point with hundreds of thousands of potential passwords, we're going to be protected somewhat with WPA3. And have you ever been in a public place like a coffee shop or an airport and you've been on a public Wi-Fi or in a hotel, you've used a pre-shared key that everybody uses? Well, there's even protection for traffic using public networks with WPA3. And if you've set up wireless routers for your home or your friend's homes, you may have noticed that on those wireless routers, there was often a button you would press and it was labeled WPS. And that stood for Wi-Fi Protected Setup. That was a way to more easily allow a client to join a network without having to dig into the configuration screen of that client. But there was a vulnerability there. Well, that's been replaced with DPP, Device Provisioning Protocol. So those are a few ways that we could do encryption of our data as it travels through the airwaves. But if somebody connects to the network and they are authenticated, let's talk about how we can limit what areas of the network they can reach. You might have seen a guest network in different organizations. They've got their private network where you have to know a password or you have to provide your credentials, but they have a guest network for people visiting. And typically what this guest network does is give a client in that guest network access to the internet, but not access to the company's private network. And interestingly, the guest network typically allows one wireless client in that guest network to talk to another wireless client in that guest network. So that may be a bit of a security concern. We can address that security concern, though, with wireless client isolation. Here, we can take a wireless client and not only isolate it from the private network, we can isolate it from other wireless devices in the guest network, where it can only get out to the internet, in addition to something like a DHCP server on the local network and uh, the default gateway. And one way that network administrators attempt to block unauthorized clients from joining the network is to check the client's MAC address. This is called MAC filtering. Let's say this wireless client wants to associate with this access point. Well, it sends in the request, but before the access point will allow it, it says, hold on, I need to see your MAC address. And uh, that wireless client's MAC address had better be on a white list of approved MAC addresses or not on a black list of denied MAC addresses, depending on which approach we're using. But MAC filtering is not considered to be a very strong protection. For one reason, it is trivial for somebody to alter the MAC address that their computer is advertising. And unfortunately, a lot of network administrators out there, they have a false sense of security that they're really protecting their network when it is easily defeated with MAC filtering. Something else we can do to limit who gets access to which portions of the network is something called geofencing. Now, this could be for security based on the GPS inside of your device. You may have to be close to your company's data center in order to access specific resources. If you're not close to that data center, you're not able to access those resources. So it can be used for security, but this is something we often see in shopping areas as well. Let's say that we've got this shopping mall and the management at this shopping mall wants different ads to appear based on where you are in the shopping mall. So these different stores could have their own wireless signal going out in front of their store. And when you walk by, it's going to be able to serve you up, possibly through a captive portal that we'll talk about in just a moment. They'll be able to serve you up advertisements, maybe a discount for their store. So geofencing can be used for something like this in a shopping mall where we get appropriate content based on our location, but it can also be used for security where we have to physically be in a location to access a resource. And I mentioned a captive portal. We typically see this in a hotel. We check into a hotel and we're told that you get free Wi-Fi with your room. But when you first attach to the room, you might be presented 
with a screen that looks something like this. Maybe you have to enter a username or your membership number if you're affiliated with that hotel chain. Maybe you need to put in your credentials like a PIN or a password and your room number. I've often seen it where you put in your last name and the room number. And this is called a captive portal. Before somebody just gets on your guest network and goes out to the internet and does who knows what, this captive portal might require them to enter some information and it might require them to agree to a terms of use. So they're agreeing not to do bad things on the network. And that's a look at a few different ways that we can better protect our wireless networks.